Hey readers, welcome back to Reads with Ruby B with me, Ruby B. And now we are going to continue with our read Gumshoes, The Case of Madison's Father by Russell Nolte. We are on chapter seven. Uh, before we begin, I will apologize about there not having been a chapter of Gumshoes for some time. I just have not had the time um, or the quiet space to record in. So that is why there has been no chapter for a while, but we're going to quit get back on track starting this week. Chapter seven, Lulu Bell. Stuart lay on, on the couch at Gumshoe headquarters, still unconscious. Madison dabbed at his, at his head with a damp cloth, occasionally stopping to dip it into a cup of water and bring it out. Maybe we should take him to the hospital, she said. It's been over an hour, and he's not waking up. <laughs> Timothy stood next to a centrifuge, holding an egg timer, and waiting for a the molecular, the molecular compound in the rag to separate. Once separated, he could analyze the, molecular, the molecules under his IR spectrometer and discover the makeup of the mysterious liquid that had knocked Stuart out cold. I don't find that to be wise, he said. If it happens to be some illicit substance, we'll surely be questioned. Besides, it's clearly not lethal. How do you figure that? Madison said. Well, your father's abductors well, if your father's abductors had wanted him dead, there would certainly be easier methods. Since, we, since they absconded with him, it's safe to assume that our concoction is not lethal. And, it's rough, and in roughly 45 seconds, we'll know for sure what it is, what, it, what is contained in its chemical makeup. The egg timer dinged and Timothy turned off the centrifuge. He carefully placed the mysterious liquid inside the spectrometer so that its makeup could be analyzed. As he pressed start on the machine, Stuart started to moan and shift on the couch. Exuberant, Madison shouted out to Timothy, Tim, he's waking up. Fantastic, said Timothy. Unfortunately, he's always quite irritable when he first wakes up, so I think I'll let you bear the brunt of his crankiness. Stuart opened his eyes. The room was bright. It gave him a throbbing headache. What? What happened? Madison handed him the cup of water she had used to dampen his head. Here, drink this. You were knocked unconscious from whatever was in the jar. Tim's analyzing it now to see exactly what to see exactly what's in it. Stuart grabbed the cup and took a huge swig. Thanks, I'm super thirsty, and it feels like a million babies are kicking the inside of my skull. After swallowing a second gulp of water, chills ran down his back from his spine to his toes. This water tastes funny. It shouldn't. I've been using it to dab at your forehead with this rag for an hour. Stuart spit the water on the floor and used the sleeve of his shirt to scrape his tongue. Gross, 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 gross. You know what that ra you know what we use that rag for? Timothy barely stopped chuckling long enough to answer. We use it to wipe bird excrement off the sill and clean up spills around the lab. Madison horrified and shut the rag out the window. That is foul. Stuart scraped his tongue vigorously. Oh, man, I can still taste it. In his fervor, his arm knocked the cup of water over, and it spilled on the floor. Hand me, a, hand me the rag, Madison. I don't have it. I threw it out the window. Stuart ran over to the window and saw, saw the rag caught on a tree limb. That was, what am I going to do now? Madison pulled a comic book limited edition dan dash 47 from the top of the stack and next to the couch there's plenty of paper in here just use that stir it dough for the cotton dough and snatched the comic from her hand just as she began to rip the cover he cradled his book in his arms like a baby no dan stopped the evil fist d fisty cups from blowing up up the down uh, from blowing up up the downtown express in that issue <laughs> what? Madison said. It's just a comic book. Timothy perked up from behind his computer where he was reviewing the printout up from the spectroscope. I've got it now. You, you've done it now. Sorry. 
excuse me, said Merson. Stuart placed the comic book down on top of the stack and smoothed out any new wrinkles Madison's handling had caused. This is not a comic book. Dan Dash is the greatest private investigator of all time. He's cool, collected, dynamite with the ladies, and always gets his man. Best of all, he doesn't need any of this technology. He uses his gut instincts, like a real old school cop. Madison tried to process this foreign concept when Timothy shouted from the, from across the room, Chloroform! Stuart spun around to see Timothy smiling with glee. Excuse me? Are you shouting random words just to shut me up, buddy? Zucchini, I can do it too. I finished my analysis of the bottle's contents, Timothy said. The compound in question is none other than chloroform. Madison shrugged her shoulders. So, can't anyone buy chloroform anywhere? Timothy vehemently shook his head. No, that's a common misconception because, because villains in movies and television shows always seem to have easy access to it. However, it is quite hard to obtain. You must have a license from the state in order to buy it, and it's very strictly re regulated. It should not be very hard to obtain a quick, complete list of buyers from the, from the past month or so. Great, Tim. Stay on that. Stuart turned to Madison. Meanwhile, do you think we could get into your father's office? There might be a clue as to why. He, there might be a clue there as to who might have wanted to hurt him. Good idea, Stuart said to him. While you and Madison attempt to infiltrate the office, I will compile a list of sub suspects. Stuart held out his hand toward Madison. Shall we? Lead the way, Madison smiled co coyly as she took his hand. The exterior of her father's office building was bland gray concrete facade with a large with a large number of big darkly tinted windows the building looked like thousands of other office buildings Stuart didn't care about that though all he cared about was how pretty madison was and how his luck had changed once they reached the door to her father's office madison stopped him my father's name is sylvester you'll need to know that if you pretend to be my friend got it yeah, no problem. Sylvester. Oh, and there's one more thing. The secretary, Luthabelle, she can be a bit much to handle. She's a dear, but just try not to be swept into her craziness. You're talking to me, Madison. I'm a rock. Madison smiled as she patted him on the cheek. Yes, yes, you are. I mean, how bad could she be? Stuart asked. And there's one more thing. Oh, sorry about that. I mean, how bad could she be? Stuart asked. As she opened the office door, Madison looked back over her shoulder. You'll see. Stuart stepped over the threshold and immediately he realized Madison actually undersold Mr. Albert's evil secretary, Lulu Bell. She was so full she was so positive and full of life that it seemed as though a bright ray of sunshine had enveloped him. Albert Mitchell, please hold. Albert Mitchell, please hold. Albert Mitchell, please hold. Lulu Bell repeated the greeting over and over with such perfect pitch and consistent deliver delivery that colors could easily mistake her for an automated machine. Okay, said Stuart. I get it. I'm tired just looking at her. Madison jabbed him in the ribs. Shh! Alberts Mitchell, please hold. Alberts Mitchell, please hold. Alberts Mitchell, please hold. Alberts Mitchell, please hold. Yes, I'm sorry, but Mr. Alberts is unavailable. Yes, you have a nice day as well. Lulu Bell kept this up, kept up this frank pace until she saw Madison. She immediately slammed down all of her phones. Even as a chorus of 
ringing continued around her, she remained completely focused on the young lady and her, gum, and her gumshoe protector. Oh, my sweet dear, Lulu Bell said. How are you? Madison propped her arms around the propped her arms on the reception desk. I'm doing all right, considering Lulu Bell yourself. Oh, I well, I'm keeping busy. Every time I stop, even for a second, to think about it, I start to cry. Lulu Bell could not hold back tears. Her bloodshot eye, her bloodshot, tired eyes were blurred behind a pool of grief, and layers of concealer she had applied that morning had washed away. Seward noticed the box of tissues. He grabbed it and offered the tissues to Lulu, who pulled out four and used them to blot her eyes. Lulu took a deep breath and calmed herself down enough to speak again. Thank you, young man. Are you here protecting little Miss Madison? Stuart shook his head. No, ma'am. I'm investigating. Madison clapped her hand over Stuart's mouth. This is Stuart. He's my friend. You know, it's hard to be alone after. Lulu Bell nodded, nodded in agreement as she blew her nose with another handful of tissues. Oh, I, don't I know it. It was hard for me to even get out of my house and away from my cats this morning. I've been here every day since those doors opened, ten years ago next week. And I'll be darn tootin' if I miss a day in this office in its hour of need. That's noble of me, ma'am, said Stuart. I have to ask you something, Miss Lulu. If it's in my power to give, you'll have it, Lulu Bell said. Do you think it would be okay if we go into my father's office and get a picture of him? Lulu Bell looked her up and down, skeptical. Surely your grandmother has lots of pictures of your father lying around the house? Yes, she does, but she doesn't have any from the past decade, Lulu. Madison said, if we wanted to see my dad as a kid, sure, I'd have tons to choose from, but nothing recent. You know he's a workaholic. And we're not best with pictures. I know he keeps some in his office, though. Lulu Bell smel smiled at her for a long, endearing moment before nodding. Of course, dear. You know, sometimes I sit in the middle of a room remembering what a wonderful man your father was. Lulu's attention turned back to the chorus of ringing phones. She quickly straightened herself up and readied herself to get to work again. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have some very scared and nervous clients. I have to keep the ship sailing, s sailing straight. You take all the time you need. Thanks, Lulu. You're the bestest. The bestest, bestest, and don't you forget it. Lulu Bell smiled seeming, and seemingly answered four phones simultaneously. Albert, Albert and Mitchells, please hold. Albert and Mitchells, please hold. Timothy paced back and forth, in front of, in front of his bank of computer monitors. Spike perched on a dialog box in the center of the screen. Followed Timothy with his eyes. Okay, my my moth friend, you might be slightly temperamental, but I am your father, so you must do as they say. Timothy sat down at the computer. I need you to grant me a administrative access to every postal shipping company in the U.S. in the United States. Spite swings fluttered nervously. I know it's a big job, but you can do it. I've decreased the, the decryption sensitivity uh, that overloaded the memory. So if you could please be so kind as to not freak out on me, I would be extreme, exceedingly grateful. Let's just take this one moment at a time. A couple more keystrokes. Spike began to burrow into the UPS mainframe. Timothy crossed his fingers and leaned back on his chair to wait. Mr. Albert's office was adorned much like his house, unlike the sparse decorations that surrounded Lulu's desk. Mr. Albert's tastes were more refined, which carried through to his ornate style. Along every wall carved oak bookshelves brimmed with leather-bound books, a bay window, the only one in the entire office park, allowed the sun to streak through on the left side of the room. His desk, made from 2,000-year-old maple tree, screamed class and elegance. Behind the desk, there was an antique grandfather clock, which had passed from father to son for three generations. It kept perfect time. 
outside of a desk, desk calendar, and an appointment book, the only picture frames adorned his desk. Madison had made each picture frame from macaroni shells. The pictures themselves depicted special events in their lives together. Mr. Alberts kept each picture as a keeps as a keepsake. It was a concrete reminder to Madison that her father cherished her. All right, Stuart, said Madison while locking the office door. We're looking for anything that could implicate anybody in debt that could implicate someone in Dad's disappearance. We don't have much time. Stuart rummaged, rummaged through the nearest bookcase. Madison walked over to, to her father's desk as she picked up a picture of their camping trip. A piece of macaroni broke free and fell to the floor. In the picture, Madison's dad held her upside down with one arm and held up a trout in the other. He wore a big smile on his face. As Madison stared longingly at the image of happier days, a single tear fell down her cheek. Are you okay? As Stuart said. Madison wiped her eyes with her sleeves. Yes, I'm fine, but Stuart sensed that she might be a little less than okay. He walked over to her with his arms wrapped around her. She rolled toward him and buried her head into his chest, sobbing at the thought of losing her father. Hey, it's okay. It's okay. It's just, just let it all out. He didn't attempt to ease her pain with any more words. Instead, he was just content to rub her back until no more tears remained. Eventually, she pushed off and left a stain comprised of tears, snot, and makeup, which completely destroyed his, his shirt. But he did not care. He was just happy to be that close to her, even for a moment. Sorry, I lost it for a moment, Madison said. I'm usually not that bluffery. No problem, said Stuart. Just don't let it happen again, he chuckled uncomfortably. I'm kidding. You can do that as much as you want. I mean, your, I mean, your dad. Well, you know, but the best defense against all those bad feelings is to get the bad guys. Well, there's got to be evidence somewhere. Madison nodded and placed the picture down on the desk, turning it away from her mis from her misdeeds. Sorry, Dad. I know you wouldn't approve of me as a criminal, so you'll have to sit this one out. Timothy anxiously spun a penny on his desk while he watched the seconds tick by. Spike had already eaten through UPS, FedEx, and DHL mainframes. Timothy was starting to lose hope. The package had not been sent by any of the US by any of the major US couriers. Spike burst through the browser window after successfully hacking into the United States Postal Service mainframe. Exhausted, the moth settled on the top of the browser window. I know that was a tough one, buddy. Rest there for a minute. As Timothy began digging, into the shipping records. Spike turned a menacing shade of red. Within a few seconds, Spike quickly became glowing white hot ping pong, ping pong across the screen at lightning speed, at lightning quick speed. Timothy had no choice but to manually shut the browser down, but to manually, manually shut down the browser program in an effort to calm Spike down. Lo and behold, it worked. Spike settled harmlessly at the corner of the menu bar. <laughs> Timothy opened Spike's programming software and searched the dialog for clues regarding the recent abnormalities. Five million lines of codes, and I'm looking for one anomaly. Think, think, think. It's as if I'm trying to find one special piece of hay in a haystack. Timothy beamed. Oh my goodness, could it be that simple? He typed a couple of keystrokes and reworked three lines of code. You were just a memory hog, weren't you? Well, that should, shop you, that should stop you from destroying my computer. 
The better now? Spike nodded and fluttered happily around the co- around the screen. Well, of course you do. Your memory consumption quadrupled every five every fifteen seconds until you literally ate everything. Until you literally ate every process and failed my system. You should feel better. At, you should feel better from. Here on out, yes, you should. Timothy scratched the the monitor right under Spike's chin, and Spike flapped his wings happily. Now, let's get to work. Stuart and Madison sat crisscross applesauce on the the floor of her father's office. After searching through every nook and cranny without a trace of a clue, they decompressed with a well-deserved break. Unfortunately, their fruitless search had brought them no closer to finding her father. Stuart leaned back. His eyes caught a glimpse of the grandfather clock. Wow, we've been here three hours. It's a good thing Lulu's busy, or she would have realized it doesn't take this long to snatch a picture. I can't take it anymore. Everything we do just leads to a dead end, Madison. Frustrated, banged her head against the wooden floorboards. Thunk. The wood sounded hollow. She rubbed her head. Wait, that wasn't right. She knocked her fist against the floorboard. Thunk. She moved her hand along the floorboards, both parallel and perpendicular, to the hollow thudding sound. Thwip, thwip, thwip. All of them made the exact same sound. And then she knocked on the first board again. Thunk. There's something weird about this one. Is it hollow? Help me lift it. There might be something underneath it. Together they dug their hands under the floorboards and pried it up with all their might. Stuart grunted and struggled to raise the floorboard higher as Madison reached into the hole and felt around. Finally, she reached around deep enough and grabbed onto something and pulled out a swath of red files, of red file folders that had been bound together with a rubber band. Got it. As Madison slid her hand out of the hole, the floorboard smacked closed and sent a reverberation through the office. They heard Lulu's chair creak as she stood and walked to the door. Are you kids still in there? It's been a long time. Are you causing problems? Lulu jiggled the the locked doorknob. That's it. I'm coming in. Just wait until I find the key. Stuart stood and pulled Madison up. I don't get it. These look like standard case files. Why would my dad need to hide them? Stuart ran over to the window and pushed it open. I don't know, but we can figure it out after we escape. Luckily, we're on the first floor. Stuart helped Madison out the window before he hopped out, shutting the window behind him. As they ran across the street, Lulu flung the door open to the office and rushed to find nothing out of out of place. I must be going insane, she said as she walked toward the window. The phone caught her attention. The phones caught her attention, and she ran to answer them. Albert Mitchell, please hold. And that is the end of chapter seven. Uh, and so, yeah. Join me for more and to find out what happens next in our next chapter. Until then, like, subscribe, and share. Keep reading. Stay awesome. Bye for now.